uh, this is one way for me to learn as well. So yeah, let's try to understand what do we mean by explainable AI? Why is it important to, to study and develop uh, tools that are explainable? Okay, so first of all, uh, let me uh, acknowledge, I have uh, referred to some of the contents from the tutorials um, given by Dr. Hima Lakaraju and Dr. Samir and Dr. Julius Adabayo. And they have uh, consecutively for two years, they have given tutorials on explainable AI. I have given the links of them also. And uh, another source I refer to is DeepFinder. Uh, they have also wonderful material on explainable AI. People, particularly people who are entering or who are beginning to know what is explainable AI, I suggest strongly to take a look at these links. Okay, <clears throat> let's try to uh, get started. So algorithmic decision-making is there everywhere. Almost any application that you think of, there are algorithms that are making decisions. Let's, for example, take healthcare. There are a lot of algorithms that uh, take your data, uh, uh, date of the patients, different parameters measured about the health of the patient, and then try to uh, infer some of these decisions towards helping the experts. This is not new, right? These days, a um, lot of things are being uh, fed to the machines for their uh, inference to be considered. Also, let's look at another application, which is um, used by banks, right? When a lot of people apply for bank loans, and when they do, they have to give a lot of details, provide information about the, their financial things. For example, it may include their annual salary or their financial behavior, like how well they have been paying their credit card bills over time, or things like that. Do they have uh, previous loans? How well they have paid back? All that data becomes features over which this intelligent algorithm will try to make an inference for the bank people whether they can afford to give the sanction the loan or it's better not to sanction the loan, right? These are all in place already. Some of, some of us may not be aware of these things, but trust me, there are all these algorithms used uh, on a daily basis. Another important application is, for example, some countries, um, the, the judicial system uses intelligent algorithms whether uh, in deciding whether a particular um, convict needs uh, can be given parole or not given parole, right? It depends, again, a lot of uh, information is fed into the algorithm, like uh, how many times he has been incarcerated and a lot of other, what is the ethnicity, what geographical area he's from, what is his age, and a lot of his or her age, and all those details are fed into this intelligent algorithm. And then a judge will take a decision, will, will take a a look at this algorithm which is making which are helping to make the decision and on top of it so uses his own experience and intelligence to go over the file which is the information and then finally a call is taken right so these are very very important applications because um, well-being of a lot of people is associated on the decision that we make particularly the decision being made by the algorithm right so these are only some or only a subset of places where algorithmic decision making is there, right? Think of computer vision applications like autonomous vehicles that we are thinking of, right? They all use machine learning, right? Machine learning, deep learning, all of them use data-driven learning, right? It, the, the, the summary is machine learning is there everywhere today. You like it, you don't like it, but it is there already. And I'm pretty sure in, in the near future, it is going to take over even more spaces or it will interact with more number of people and more number of occasions on a daily basis right as i said some of these applications are very very critical some of them may not be very critical for example uh, you're you're talking to your alexa you you ask it to play one of your favorite songs but it recognized something else when you uttered it, it may not recognize it correctly right but that's okay it's not very critical maybe you are a bit irritated because you didn't get the song you wanted to play. But think of other critical applications like healthcare or the, 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 uh, the judicial system when they use and they make something, so if they make a mistake, it's going to be really costly, right? 
and uh, autonomous vehicle is also uh, need to be really, really good. And we cannot afford even a single mistake in those systems, right? So particularly when we deploy systems or algorithms in these critical applications, we want these algorithms to be explainable. We want to be able to understand why the model has taken a certain decision. Is there a way a machine or an algorithm can explain why it suggests to do something, right? If it is a human expert, for example, if it is a doctor, you can probably ask what is the rationale behind uh, his or her decision to go for the surgery or not go for the surgery, right? Because you can pose questions and discuss things over, it is easily explainable what the human decision is. But in case of algorithms, we want similar interpretability with the decisions because as I said, these are very critical applications. We need to be able to understand clearly those systems. Right, let's, let's for, for a simple starting point, you, you take a simple application of object detection, object recognition or image recognition in other words. So the input as I showed, let me just highlight. So this can be an input and you can think of a CNN classifier or any of your favorite classifiers as the predictive model, which I just showed it as a black box. So it is accepting the input and it is predicting the, the label to be um, Siberian Husky, which is the correct label for this image. The, the, the animal that is there in the image is a Siberian Husky. All right, we are happy that the model is predicting correctly and the accuracy is very well. But if I want to really understand why the model thinks it is a Siberian Husky, I want the model to explain what is the rationale behind its decision for predicting Siberian Husky. Let's say there is an algorithm which can help us explain the model. In this case, it is one of your favorite classifiers, okay? So you can see the model has come up with this kind of an explanation, saying that I have seen these regions that are highlighted in the explanation to make my decision. If you look at the regions that are highlighted carefully, it is only the snow region that is there in the image, right? The, the bottom right corner, the bottom left corner, and towards the bottom, sorry, top left corner, the regions that are highlighted, majority of them are snow. So what do we understand from this explanation is the model has learned only the spurious correlations. Whenever there, there are images of Siberian Husky, they were always taken, maybe most, most of the cases, the Siberian Husky was taken or photographed with a snow background. All the data set probably has similar images. Wherever uh, there is snow, only those regions you photograph with them. And instead of learning the features of the Siberian Husky, the model in this case is learning only the correlation of uh, presence of snow with the label Siberian Husky, which is not intelligent, right? In a way, it is stupid. One would expect the model to learn what makes this a Siberian Husky, maybe the fur or maybe the color of these animals or something specific to the, the facial features or something like that. That would be more, more reasonable. But on the other hand, the model picked up on the snow that is present in the images of Siberian Husky. So this is one, one reason or one, one use case of model understanding. You can debug the models whether the model has learned something meaningful, something reasonable, or the model is just learning on some uh, irrelevant correlations that exist uh, in, in the data set, right? So this is only one case, why one needs to study model understanding. Model understanding means explanations um, that, are, uh, that, that can uh, explain the inference made by the predictive model, okay? So all these terms are very, very much interchangeable, model understanding, explanation, interpretability, everything is boiling down to making the model explain its decision. We are trying to understand the model by asking the explanations. Why do you make this decision? Is there some reason behind your decision? Everything boils down to making the AI model explainable. Okay, this is one case, one use case, why one needs to study model understanding. Okay, let's look at another example. This is our, our favorite uh, example where the defendant um, is trying to get a uh, parole, let's say. So the file which 
essentially contains all the details, like all the yeah the basic details you can think of, which which are required to make the decision of giving sanctioning parole or not sanctioning parole. Okay, so let's say you uh, fed all these details and the predictive model. Again, this is a binary classification: whether to release or not to release. There are only two categories the model can predict. This also can be your one of your favorite classifiers, and it is predicting risky to release. The model thinks that the, the, the candidate need not may not be given parole. Okay. Now you obtained a prediction, but you want to know as a judge or, or a end user, you want to understand why the model has predicted. Are there any important features it is looking at? Or what information in the file made the model to predict not to release? So let us say one of the cases, this is the scenario. It is relying on the features of the input, such as race or the number of crimes the person has committed, and also the gender. If you look at this uh, emphasis given by the model in this case, it is emphasizing more on the race and also gender. Because this person is belonging to a certain race and also belonging to a certain gender, the model is trying to predict risky to release. Right? This is also not a fair um, decision to make. Right? If, if the emphasis is more given onto the crimes, maybe it's more meaningful because if the person's crimes are heinous, if it is more likely that the person may commit more crimes, it is reasonable not to risk not to release right but on the other hand the model here in this case is trying to rely on the race value and the gender value to make this decision again this is also not reasonable the model should do something more meaningful than relying on some uh, sensitive information which may not be um, fair right so in this case it detected the, the model understanding helped us to detect bias that is present in the data and the model also. Because there is bias in the data, when you train on the training data, the model also gets biased, right? So this is one way to find out if the model is biased towards certain genders or biased towards certain races in the population, right? So this is another, another uh, important use case, why one needs to study model understanding. Let's take another example where uh, the application is about uh, sanctioning the loan or denying the loan. Sorry, is, is there a question? By mistake, perhaps uh, ah, this, I'm right. going to mute. All right, let's, let's proceed. So this also is a binary classification. Just a minute. Thank you. Please right. continue. Right. So this is also another classification scenario where the output is two classes, whether sanctioning the loan or denying the loan. What information is fed? Again, there is information like what is the annual salary, how much is um, his uh, EMI already getting paid, or are there any previous loans that uh, he or she has completed successfully or completed unsuccessfully, things like that. All the financial behavior goes into as the input to the classifier. Okay, now the in this case, the prediction is denying the loan. Okay, this is fine, but we want to understand why the model has denied loan for this particular applicant. Let's say the model understanding or the algorithms that we are going to study came up with this kind of an explanation, right? Okay, you are, uh, you are denied the loan, but if you want to be sanctioned, these are the requirements that you can work on. For example, increase your annual salary by 50,000 and also pay your credit card bills on time for the next four to five months. So these are lacking in your application because of these things we had to deny the loan, right? This is a wonderful explanation why the model has denied a loan. But so far, the models do not do this, right? They simply take the input, do whatever they have to do and predict the inference, whether to sanction the loan or deny the loan. But on the other hand, think of a scenario where you can pose a question or the model itself can tell you, this is my inference. Currently, we are denying the loan. Why? Because there are some shortcomings and you can work on those shortcomings. These are exactly the shortcomings. Your annual salary is less by 50,000. And also you have not paid your previous three months credit card bills on time. 
So your Sybil score is less. All that explanation you can come up with. Instead of simply surprising the, the user, you can also provide this kind of recourse. Basically, what he or she needs to do in order to get the loan or in order to get a specific output from the model, right? So this also is very, very useful in uh, applications like this, where the model understanding provides uh, the, the, the suitable recourse to be taken by the user, right? So these are only certain are, are only a subset of things that are possible when you have models that are explainable, when you have models that can speak back to you instead of spitting out the label alone, if they are able to do all these things, it will be a wonderful thing, right? It is a very much desired um, behavior from the AI models. So overall, let's try to summarize the, the motivation behind why we need interpretable or explainable um, AI or why we need the models to be understood, okay? So on one side, utility is huge. Like you can debug the models, you can understand if there is bias in the models or if and when you should trust the models, when you should not trust the models, etc. For example, you think of a medical diagnosis where uh, you have trained a decision tree, simple decision tree algorithm, and it is uh, deciding whether you will need medicine or you will not need medicine. That means whether you are sick or not sick. Uh, probably you, you, you can easily find out whether you need treatment of certain kind or not. Okay, if that is the decision, let's say your, your decision tree has made all the tree growing has been done and you want to see um, in certain cases, let's say if it is uh, uh, patients of certain age, 60 to 70, right? In those cases, probably you did not have enough data and it is simply relying on some very weak features, like which area they are living in. If the person is living in certain areas of uh, geographical location, it is classified. So you, you may end up uh, classifying something like that. The decision tree, if you run it, it may end up doing that because there are features of that, that, uh, that type, right? So essentially what I'm telling is, certain cases, you don't need to trust your model because you don't have sufficient data or it is not really intelligent in that region, right? If that is the case, you can only exclude those decisions and the rest of the decisions you can consider, right? So utility can be decided if there is explanations and also recourse. So what needs to be done in order to expect a certain classification output? For example, the bank loan, right? What was missing in the applicant's application? what he needs to improve in order to get a loan. That can be provided. And also you can assess the model suitability. You can, you can carefully, critically understand whether this model is suitable or not suitable for deployment. That is what we need, right? As think of policymakers who really want to encourage the, the big players, uh, uh, AI players that want to uh, put models in the real world. But at the same time, you need to think of reliability, safety, security, everything. So you need to have some mechanism to really understand the suitability of deployment. So that is why we need model understanding. And stakeholders are everybody. End users also need it because as a, as a loan applicant, I need to know what needs to be improved in my case. And decision makers like doctors and judges, they are really, um, they, they, it will be really helpful for them to have explainable AI are the model understanding tools, right? And regulatory authorities, regulatory authorities like FDA. Safe driving model, right? So these regulatory authorities also can use model understanding and explainable AI tools. In a sense, stakeholders are huge and utility is also huge, right? That is why people have started looking at it in a, in a big way. For example, if you look at the Google Trends to find out the the, the popularity of the word explainability or explainable AI over the last five years, it has monotonically increased. That, that again tells you that the emphasis on explainable AI has, has been growing continuously for, for the last five to 10 years, right? Because as I said, machine learning is there everywhere. It is, you like it or not, it is, it is taking up, um, on a daily basis, it is taking up more and more space, right? It is interacting with humans on a very regular basis. So obviously you need to have better and reliable things to interact with us, to make decisions for us, because that is why, because of that, you need explainable AI.
Okay, that's the first part. I hope I have convinced you that it is something really important to have explainable models that are easily understandable, that are easy to interpret their decisions, etc. Okay, now let's uh, look at how do we achieve model understanding. So there are two ways broadly. Achieving model understanding can be uh, broadly categorized into two ways. One, you can try building in inherently interpretable models. For example, linear models or shallow decision trees like that are inherently interpretable. Why do I say these are inherently interpretable? I'll take a couple of examples and, and tell you how you can interpret the decisions made by these models. Okay, this is one way, building inherently inter interpretable models. And the second way is, you build very complex models that are difficult to interpolate, uh, interpolate. For example, deep neural networks with hundreds of layers. It is really difficult to interpret because they have millions of parameters, they have layers, and they have regularizers like dropout, batch normalization, whatnot. Everything is there. By default, they are very sophisticated. You can think of them as black box classifiers or machine learning models. Then you can build an expl explanation tool on top of these methods. This is second way. Right? So explain pre-built models in a post hoc manner. You perform the inference and then now you try to explain. Right? This is second way. One is straightforward, build inherently interpretable models. Second is build something sophisticated and then augment them with explanation methods. Okay. So that is about broadly uh, the, the different ways of realizing explainable AI. So when do when do we go for what? Okay, how to decide? So let's say uh, if you if you carefully look at this uh, whole context, you will try to understand. You, you will understand that there is an inherent trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. So accuracy being small, they are, it, it it is easy to understand that they are simple models like linear regression, logistic regression, and shallow decision trees. Because they are simple, you will not get super high accuracy, right? But you can get high interpretability, right? Interpretability, they score high, but accuracy, they score less. But on the other hand, deep neural networks and other complex uh, random forest, things like that, you will have high accuracy, but they will not be easy to interpret, right? They score less on interpretability and high on accuracy, right? So in other words, it is something like this, okay? So it's an inherent trade-off. If you are looking for higher accuracy models, they are not interpretable. If you're looking for interpretable models, they are not strongly accurate, okay? So because of this, what generally does, what is what we generally do is basically, you look at the data. If data is something like this, which is linearly separable, almost linearly separable, right? If something like this is your data, you can directly build something simple, which is interpretable. And also because the data is not complex, you can get accurate models also, right? But on the other hand, if if the data is very, the task is very difficult, the, the classification surface is not linear, something really complex, then you obviously have to go to sophisticated models like deep neural networks. And on top of it, go for post hoc explanations, right? So that's the summary. When you have easy data, you can try directly inherently interpretable models like linear regression, logistic regression, or things like that. But if the data is really complex, task is complex, you go for deep neural networks kind of sophisticated tools and then go for post hoc explanations. So this is how we decide what to use. Okay, so that's about second module, how to decide how many kinds of interpretable approaches are there broadly. Again, this is not a uh, very strong taxonomy. This is broadly in order to facilitate easy understanding, communities dividing the approaches into inher inherently interpretable models and then post hoc explanations. Okay, so that's about the basic taxonomy also. Now let's try to understand the word explanation uh, in, in a bit more detail. What is an explanation? So any interpretable description of the model behavior, okay? Anything that describes the model behavior is an explanation, right? So there can be different possibilities for explanation. Most of, a good number of uh, descriptions can qualify to be an explanation. Let's not tell, uh, let's not discuss some of the possibilities for explanations, okay? Again, you can, at any point in time, if you're not able to follow or if you have some questions, feel free to 
um, probably raise a hand or put it in the chat box. I'll try to uh, attend them. All right, so let's see. There is a classifier or some complex or uh, simple machine learning model is there on one side, and there is user who, who is using it. He can be the end user, he can be a regulatory authority, or he can be a, uh, a policy maker who has to decide on whether this can be deployed in the real world or not, okay? Anybody, a user is there. So an explanation sits in between these two. The explanation's job is to connect the classifier and the user. And at the same time, it, it, has to, it needs to be faithful to the classifier, okay? Whatever this explanation is about, it should be correctly describing what the classifier's behavior is, right? And th think of something unfaithful. Although classifier is relying on features one, two, three, and explanation wrongly shows that it is relying on features five, six, it is unfaithful, right? You don't want such an explanation. Explanation needs to be faithful. It has to really bring out what the classifier is looking at, right? On one side, it has to be faithful. And on the other side, it has to be understandable. Whatever the explanation tells should be easily interpretable to the user. Right, it, it has to speak a language of the user, whatever it is. If it is uh, telling what needs to be improved or it, if it is identifying the portions of the input, whatever it is, it should be easily understandable to the user. So these are primarily the characteristics an explanation should have. It should be faithful. It should represent exactly what classifier is relying, unlike wrongly representing what classifier behavior is. It, it is, it is, so it should be avoided, okay? And understandable is easy to understand. Whatever explanation is, it's because it should be consumed by human, because these models are going to interact with humans, end user is human. So it should be understandable by the human. So let's see some examples of explanations. If the explanation sends all the parameters of the model, because it is a machine learning model, it, have, it will have some parameters. So if the explanation is sending all the parameters to the user, is it a good explanation? It is an explanation, but is it a good explanation? Maybe not, because some of the models will have thousands and millions of parameters. But on the other hand, some of the models will have simple parameters. Let's uh, talk about, in, in fact, we will see some example, um, linear regression and logistic regression example, where parameters can help explain the model in this case, okay? But not always, right? Because as I said, if there are too many parameters and they interact in a complex way, user will be confused to understand what exactly is the effect of each feature, right? And how about sending many example predictions? Maybe in some cases it is a good explanation. Why? Let's, let's think of a very complex looking chair, okay? If you present the chair image, which you know, right? The interior designers, they develop crazy looking interiors like a uh, very crazy looking chair or, or things like that. Let's say uh, the model has encountered something like that and it classified it as a chair but you had a difficulty in understanding why it had predicted the object to be a chair. In that case, the model can look at the training images and show a 10, of, a 10 such images of chairs, where the test case is also looking very similar to those training 10 sets. Okay, Then by looking at other 10 training images, the user can understand, oh, these, these look like chairs, and the test case is also looking similar to them. So that is why the model also predicted chair, right? So that is one of the explanations by being, bringing some example training images and showing these are the reason why I predicted whatever it has predicted. It can be a chair, it can be a bottle, it can be a laptop, anything, right? It can bring some examples from the training data and show these are the reasons it looks like a chair, okay? And also, it can summarize with, with a program or a rule or tree. We will see a decision tree is essentially a rule, right? If feature one is in between these ranges and feature two is greater than something, feature three is less than something, you classify into a class. So that is an explanation. Because your input features follow this path in the decision tree, I predicted this. So that is also an explanation. It is easy to read by any human, right? So that also can qualify to be an explanation. And similarly, you can go on. It can select most important features in the input. For example, we have seen that uh, Siberian Husky example, right? In that example, the explanation method identifies the important features in the input. And in that case, it was not very meaningful. But anyway, 
it, it is also an explanation, right? And describe how to flip the model prediction. If the explanation describes what changes need to be made in the input in order to change the prediction of the model, that is also something explanation, right? Because what features are more important for this class? Because if you change that, the label is changed, right? So these are only a subset of possibilities for explanation. It's a broad concept, whatever tells or makes the model to be understood by the end user can qualify to be an explanation. It's, uh, I hope you, you are able to see that this is pretty open-ended definition for an explanation, right? All right, so that's about what can be an explanation. As I said, there are uh, n number of such um, potential candidates to be qualified as an explanation. Now, again, there are a lot of varieties in explanations. It uh, local versus global explanation. For example, local global is an explanation that characterizes the model overall, right? It's it's a bit complicated. Overall, it needs to uh, characterize the model. On the other hand, local means within the neighborhood of a single point, whatever is your test data, within uh, it can be any training data also you chose a data point and within the small neighborhood of that data point, you are providing an explanation for the model. That is local explanation. On the other hand, you want the explanation for the overall model behavior. That is a global explanation, which is obviously difficult because the, the input domain can be complex and the decisions made by the decision uh, algorithm can be quite um, based on the local region, it can be quite different. Some places it can be linear, some places it will be non-linear, things like that, right? So, yeah. So that's also for our easy understanding, we divide them to local and global explanations. Again, it is pretty straightforward. So what is global and uh, no, local? And also other ways of taxonomy, model agnostic, model specific. Some algorithms are independent of what is the classifier. Some are specific to some of the classifiers. And some of them work on only certain data types. Some of them work on other, uh, I mean, different data types, et cetera. Okay, so based on the explanation type, is it a visual explanation? Is it a data points? Is it a showing importance of features? Is it explaining through a surrogate model, right? So as the theory is evolving, more and more different types of explanations are coming up every day. And obviously you have to accommodate them. And if you look at the bigger picture, there are varieties of explanation methods. All right. So now that is broadly what is explanation, why we need uh, them and broad classification of them. Now let's look at some of the examples specifically. Let's start with inherently interpretable models, the first category. There are some models which are not highly accurate, but they can be easily interpretable. As I said, this is the region we are targeting. Right? These models are not very accurate, but by construction, they're easy to interpret. We can easily see what is happening, why the decision or how the decision to be made. Okay, Particularly, we'll talk about uh, the regression, sorry, linear and logistic regression both, and then decision trees. Okay. okay, let's look at, without delay, let's look at linear regression. So these are simple models, so I'll not be de discussing the internal details of it. Simply, it fits a linear model, right? It fits a line with, between input and output. How, do, how does it look like? Something like this. On the x-axis, you have input. On the y-axis, you have y, right? Y means output. So you will have a line fitting uh, between x and y. How does it look like? It's based on the number of features you have. You will have beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 and so on. So in, in the figure, it is only one-dimensional input x1. So the y-axis would be your output y. But in general, if you have n input features, it will have n plus one features or n plus one parameters, beta zero all the way to beta u, right? And you will have a lot of training data. You will define a mean squared error loss function and then try to update the parameters either in closed form solution or iteratively you can get the best values for beta zero and so on beta n. Once you get that, this is how it looks like, right? Now let's look at how we can interpret this linear regression model. So this is my model, y is equal to beta zero plus beta one and so on beta. So impact of an input variable xi can be interpreted as beta i. So what does it mean? If I change any feature xi by one, that means xi becomes xi plus one, how much of y will be changed? It will be changed by beta i, 
right? Because now beta i times xi plus one will be added because I changed xi by one. So the output changes by beta, right? So that is how it, it can easily explain, right? Think of an uh, example case. Now you are into advertising. You want to uh, increase the sales of your product and you, you want to uh, advertise your product also. Let's say you are spending some amount of money on newspaper advertisement, some amount of money on television advertisement, some amount of money in social media advertisement. Okay, so X1, X2, X3 stands for each of them, newspaper, social media, and then television. So now you, why is the sales that you can get out of spending uh, X1 on advertisement one, X2 on X advertisement two and so on, right? So you are linking the amount you're spending, the, the, the money you're spending in advertising to your sales, right? So let's say this is your relation. Now you can ask, if I want to increase my sales by a thousand, how much I need to increase my spending on television advertisement, right? So this kind of explanations are possible because the equation is very straightforward that connects input to output, right? So whatever you want to work on, whether it is easy to increase my sales by spending on TV advertisement or newspaper advertisement or social media advertisement, you know the if you know the beta one, two, three values, you will easy to you will easily make the decision, right? Where you need to put in the uh, investment to grow the sales by so much. Okay, so I hope you are able to see why the model linear regression is very easy to interpret because it is directly connecting the input to output via beta i. Right, that is why. So that's about um, linear regression. Now let's look at logistic regression. This is a very straightforward ex uh, extension of linear regression to classification. What does it do? It will simply take the uh, equation that we have seen and passes through sigmoid function, right? Like this, y is equal to sigmoid of the input, which is a linear combination of betas and input xs. If this y value is greater than 0.5, you will have class one, if the y value is less than 0.5, you predict class zero, right? Now, the same question you can ask, how x1 and so on xn can impact the y in an exponential way, e raised to bi way. Of course, uh, sigma means one by one plus e power this, but you will see the, the impact directly via the equation, right? So you can ask the same questions in order to increase my y, so on, so where can I, increase my x how can i affect my x1 to xn right this is also very straightforward just that you have a, a different set of equations connecting input to output right now let's look at another example which is a decision tree classifier so let's let's think of another problem where um, the problem here is predicting whether a patient will have a heart stroke pretty soon or will not have a heart stroke pretty soon Okay, that's a binary classification again. So what is the data we are consuming? So it can be things like this. It can be uh, features like uh, gender, hypertension is there or not, whether he or she is suffering from heart disease or not, is he ever married, does he have children, and all these BMI, whether he smokes, whether he drinks, and all the features you can take up and then try to learn this uh, simple binary classification, uh, sorry, with decision trees. So how does decision tree look like? So you go on branching the tree based on maximizing the information. So I'm skipping those details. I, I believe that uh, most of you have familiarity with this thing. So you, you go on branching to maximize the information entropy, right? So finally, this is one of the possibilities for a decision tree classification. So what does it tell if the age of the patient is greater than or equal to 50, you take this, this branch with what I'm highlighting, and then another feature, BMI feature, based on the BMI feature, which is greater than or equal to 25 or less than 25, you decide whether the, the patient is gonna face stroke or no stroke, okay? So this itself is, as I described to you, uh, you can easily see and interpret the decision made by the classifier, decision tree, right? It's, it's almost straightforward. The rules are clearly written. Look at these so-and-so features, and if they assume these values, this is the inference. If they assume a different set of values, this is the inference, okay? These models, again, 
very easy, straightforward to interpret. But the only downside is they are not, for complex problems, they may not give super cool accuracy, right? That's the downside. So that is why we have post hoc explanations where you can work with very sophisticated classification algorithms and then try to explain what they are uh, looking at, okay? All right, so there are explanation uh, methods. Uh, even in the past five, six years, very, it looks like a very short amount of time, but the, there are a good number of um, excellent tools uh, have been developed in, in post hoc explanations also. It is really difficult to cover almost uh, all of them, but I'll try to introduce some of the familiar ones that too very briefly, okay? Just to make sure you, you try, you understand what is the thought process and how to analyze these models, how to make them uh, explain their, their inference, okay? So one of the such models is LIME, local, interpretable, model agnostic explanations, right? Everything is very clear. Whether it is local or global, it is local, uh, interpretable, that is what we want. Model agnostic or not, that also is clearly mentioned that it is model, model agnostic. LIME tool can be used on any model, not with specific models. So that's about their characteristics. Let's consider a binary classification. What LIME does, I'll tell gra graphically um, without getting much into the technical details, okay? So let's say we are working with a binary classification. So whatever is the classification, we don't care whether it is a, a MLP or, or a complex CNN, doesn't matter. So this is the uh, classification surface, right? So all the blue points, your training set are classified into no stroke and the purple ones classified onto stroke, okay? This is the same problem, um, but they have only two features, okay? Although we have seen 13 features, for the sake of simplicity, you just understand that there are only two features based on which you're classifying, okay? Now, let's put a test case. We have a patient arrived and we plotted the feature one and feature two. Now, what should be the classification? What is the model predicting? whether the person will suffer stro stroke or no stroke. Can I have some responses in the chart? Based on the model learned, what is the model gonna predict? Clearly it is a stroke because it is in the white region, which belongs to the strike, sorry, stroke category. If it is in the blue region, it is no strike, no stroke, sorry. Yeah, so you're right. It is going to predict as a stroke. Now we want to understand why. What is the reason? What the classifier is relying on? Questions like this. Instead of simply accepting the person going to suffer, we want to see, is there something more we can get from the classifier? So LIME, what it does is, it is a local explanation. So it doesn't try to explain the model behavior globally, but locally, add to the test scenario what is being input. So this per, uh, red point is, red data is the point of interest. So let's zoom in the behavior of the model within the local neighborhood of that test data. So if you zoom in, this is what happens. Within the neighborhood, the classifier is just a linear classifier, right? It looks almost like a linear classifier. So within the local neighborhood, although it is a sophisticated model, but within the neighborhood of this point, it is a local classifier, sorry, a linear classifier. Like the, the, you can see, you can almost fit a line uh, at the boundary of uh, both the categories and towards the left is one category, which is stroke. Towards the right is another category, non-stroke. So what exactly happens, the math behind this line is, you will try to learn a simple classifier within the neighborhood of a test point. Okay, so within this neighborhood, you want to replace or you want to approximate the model with a simple model. Simple means linear model. So let's say F is your complex model. You are trying to learn G, which is a linear model. It can be simple linear regression or logistic regression. Okay, and within that neighborhood, you need some training data also to learn, right? You can perturb the data X, which is your test data and generate pi X. Pi X is like, in case of uh, uh, image data, you can think of rotating, flipping, adding some noise, things like that. These are supposed to fall within the close neighborhood of that X on the manifold of images. But in other images, uh, other data types, you can also come up with some sort of perturbations 
that can lie on the neighborhood of the test data. Within that neighborhood, you try to approximate EF with a simple model. Why simple? Because simple models are easy to interpret. If you learn simple models, by default, they will explain. Like we have seen linear regression and logistic regression, right? You can clearly understand effect of each feature, etc. In this case, if you line, if you fit a linear classifier, you can easily see an explanation. Why? Because the feature two, whatever it is, it is BMI or the feature that is something like um, uh, maybe it is it is a uh, one of the thirteen features. You can think of it as a BMI, for example. Okay, because the BMI is less than something. The, the, the candidate or the, the subject is prone to stroke, right? That is one explanation in this scenario, right? Which, is, which was not possible with a global look at the classifier. But if you approximate that during, uh, within the neighborhood of the uh, test point, you can come up with very simple explanations for that complex model. Okay, this is what Lime does. Although I have skipped a lot of gory details, but this is what it boils down to, right? approximating the complex models within the small uh, close neighborhood and then try to explain okay again just for the sake of completeness i am picking uh, these different explanation methods okay so i'll talk about another set of explanation methods particularly towards okay there, there seems to be a question uh, is it comparing with threshold value and making decisions so in this case you can you can clearly see Yes, in a way it is. Oh, hold on, I'm trying to go to the previous slide. Yeah, so in this case, if it is simple line that you're fitting, so that is what is happening, right? The, the threshold for that, uh, the decision to be made are, are the feature, the threshold value on the feature, it looks like this value. If the feature is something beyond this, probably you're, you will move towards this region and this region, the entire region is labeled as no stroke, no stroke, right? So in a way, you can you can kind of come up with a threshold value also, but essentially what is happening is the, the line clearly separating, right? If the X1, X2 values fall in this region, it is going to uh, classify non-stroke. But something like that is not possible here. Can you tell me simply uh, X1, a set of X1 and X2 values uh, with a line, where one side of the line is blue and one side of the other side of the line is purple for so the entire classification no it is not possible only within the local neighborhood because it looks like a linear classification boundary you can tell that these values of x y are you can say x x2 greater than this and also x1 greater than this something like that you can define the region that is only possible within the local neighborhood trust me okay so that's about explaining the the behavior of the classifier within the local neighborhood. You, you can clearly specify rules also, threshold on X1, threshold on X2, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that is about line. And things like shape, SHAP, SHAP and all are there, um, which are very, very similar to these things and, and develop on uh, line, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that is one category of explanation. Now let's look at another important category of uh, explanations. We have seen computer vision has been benefited by CNN classifiers immensely, right? So CNNs are there predicting uh, medical diagnosis, not, not only commercial applications like object recognition, object detection, et cetera, they are there everywhere, right? So that obviously made a naturally drawn in, uh, interest to make these models explainable and provide visual explanations to their inference. Okay, a lot of... Uh, Literature has been developed in this particular subdomain, I will call. So CNNs are complex machine learning systems. They have hundreds of layers and millions of parameters. So most often you will have uh, supervised data where you have images and labels, and that is what CNN uses to train the classifiers, right? But what do they learn exactly? How do they make the inference? Often these models do not provide that explanation. They simply take the input, run hundreds of layers, and simply predict the label. But, but for most of us, it, it, it is a, a black box. So slowly, the efforts have been made to uh, make those things not so black boxes. Instead, we, we need explanations of the models, right? Although you didn't tell 
why it is a cat during training you simply said this is an input x and the corresponding label is cat and this is another input x and the corresponding label is elephant we didn't tell why this is a cat uh, this is a cat or this is an elephant we simply provided pairs of x and y but we want the cnn which is uh, the decision making algorithm to provide why it predicts what it predicts okay so that is where we are heading for example an explanation can be visual so if the first image is input instead of simply predicting there is a bird in the image it can identify the regions in the input because of which the cnn has said there is a bird right if it is identifying these locations for the category predicted bird it is meaningful because they are the bird pixels right it can also give away the region like a map the visual map for the second image also it is predicting whatever is the category maybe it is a deer category it is not only fitting the label deer but also giving away the regions the support for the decision in in two different ways one identifying the pixels or it can also give away the map because of these regions i am predicting that there is a deer in the image this is a visual explanation right remember we did not provide these explanations during the training we only provided input x and the label y we did not say where the object is present no we simply gave the pairs of x and y but this explanation is really useful think of all the applications think of um, uh, healthcare where uh, an x ray image is given to the algorithm and it predicts there is a, a cancer tissue or there is no cancer tissue when there is a cancer, when it, when it makes a diagnosis to be positive for the cancer it can identify the regions because of which it can it came up with this decision of having the tumor right so these are very very useful explanations these are making the model interact with the end user whether it is the medical practitioner or the patient things like that right anybody and everybody can be using these explanations so there are broadly three different categories again this is also not a standard categorization based on the broad observations community tries to Uh, put them into groups visual uh, neuron visualization evidence localization and feature reconstruction so all of them are very related in a way so for example what is uh, neuron localization uh, sorry neuron visualization you can think of so there are millions of neurons in cnn right you can you can ask what each neuron is learning so it is loosely related to the the objectives of individual brain regions in the human brain for example some of the regions in the brain are responsible for our um uh, viewing activity some of the neurons are responsible for our listening activity some of them for creative activity things like that right each of them are divided into sub subsets uh, specializing in different areas right for example in a cnn also one of the neurons can be activating for human objects in the input it fires only if there is human object in the input it recognizes it tries to learn uh, to recognize only those objects in the second row you can see uh, one of the neurons is firing for dog objects and the third row it is firing for some food object and also some some flower kind of an object and it can fire some other neuron can fire for text in the image if there is some text in the image that neuron may fire over training it has learned that capability of firing to specific stimuli stimuli is what is being applied on the input right so that kind of specialities can be learned and that can be visualized that can that is an explanation also when does this neuron fire when there is such an input it will fire that's also an explanation right so this is broadly what uh, neuron visualization is and evidence localization is also there are huge uh, approaches huge number of approaches um based on the gradient based on the back propagation and all so what essentially it does is back propagation is finding out the sensitive region so if you if you try to compute do score by do i okay uh, simply think of a trained classifier it is already trained and you want to understand and make the model explainable how do you do you prod you provide an input and it will predict something whatever it is predicting you come you name it as sc now you compute the derivative of that sc with respect to i i is input so what will happen this is my input i compute it is predicting let's say ship category and do that sc by do input 
it will show the regions in the input for which the score is sensitive, right? So that is what derivative means, right? It will find the sensitivity of Y with respect to the input variable X. So these regions in the input can affect the score for that class heavily. Clearly, these are the regions of the shape. If these pixels were different, it will not make a shape and the score will not be predicted for shape, right? So this is the funda. What regions in the input the score relies more on? What regions in the input can affect the score very shortly, right? So those are the relevant areas. Only then it will affect the score very sharply, right? So that is another thought process behind making this CNN classifiers visual, uh, explainable via these kind of visualizations. Because these are images, they, those are called visualizations. Essentially, those are all explanations only because they are explaining what regions in the input are very important for the classification. So like this, there are a lot of other approaches also. Essentially, they'll take the input. They don't stop at predicting the label, but they'll also provide regions in the input which are important, which are the deciding regions to predict whatever it has predicted, okay, right? So these are all visual explanations. And also you can, you can try to find um, for input features, how does the, for, for output features, how does the input look like also? So these are not per se visualization methods or explanations, but people wanted to understand is there a possibility to reconstruct the features also? Again, this is, as I said, not very relevant, but just for the sake of completeness, I have added. Okay, so let's try to summarize. <clears throat> we have seen uh, what is explanation and uh, why we need to have explainable methods. What are the advantages have, of having explainable methods, right? M models can be um, debugged. Models can be understood whether there is a bias towards certain features, certain populations. And we can also provide recourses, corrective actions to, to make certain other decisions based on what you have already, what you lack, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is all the motivation. Now there are broadly uh, two ways of going about it. One is um, inherently interpretable models. You can work with them, but the downside is they do not have strong classification accuracy, strong performance is not there. So if your data is not so complex, you can directly go for them. But if your data is complex, the task is difficult. You have to sophistication methods like DNNs, et cetera, but then they are not interpretable. So you need to develop another algorithm to make them interpretable. That is called post hoc explanation, right? So we have seen some simple methods like logistic regression, linear regression, decision trees, where the models themselves are self-explanatory. But on the other hand, deep neural networks are not. So you need methods like uh, lime, sharp, or visual explanation methods that we have just now seen, right? So that's about uh, what we have seen so far. And in summary, transparency or explainability is useful at different stages of AI. For example, let's say there are three stages of AI. The first stage is AI is significantly weaker than humans. For example, tasks like visual question answering or autonomous driving, AI has not shown any promise there. We don't have self-driving cars yet, right? There, we need, to, we need to identify where the current models fail, why they fail, what they're relying on, right? We, we can ask why you are failing, why you are not able to take the right decision. If at all it comes up with an explanation, we will understand where they lack, and then we can work on our R&D to fix those problems. That is one stage where the AI is not promising in certain tasks. On the other hand, there is certain level of tasks where AI is on par with humans. For example, object recognition is, is kind of okay. Now we have CNNs that can recognize with uh, close to human accuracy, right? That is where we can establish trust on those models because you can ask for an explanation, the model will explain. And that is one way to gain the confidence of AI models because they are explaining properly whatever decision they are making, they are explaining properly. If at all, they are explaining properly. We can present this to policymakers and all so that those models can be put into action deployment. That is one stage where AI is on par with humans. Now, there is another stage. AI is significantly stronger than humans. For example, 
even our champions in chess and go are getting defeated with hum, uh, with machines right you might have seen alpha go and other uh, algorithms they they are beating the most intelligent players so that is where ai is significantly stronger than humans only certain tasks they are stronger what we can do we can see how they are making that step that particular step which defeated the human or the sequence of steps that made the machine to defeat the human we can understand what is the thought process of the machine how by asking again an explanation we can ask to explain the model what what it was thinking how it it made that move if at all it explains properly we can teach we can learn from the machines right it is opposite of machine learning it is machine teaching because so far we have been teaching machines machines are being learning right but now if at all these tasks they can explain we as humans can learn from machines machines can teach us because they are significantly stronger than humans in certain tasks that also can be done using explanations a proper faithful explanation method if at all there is one it can teach how humans are sorry how machines are learning and how humans can learn also right so there are a lot of ways explanations are required and explanations can be beneficial right and there are a lot of challenges also it is not a solved area lot of things need to be answered for example all the way we were talking about classification we did not go beyond classification explanations should go beyond classification and we have not touched upon privacy fairness things like that we have so far the explanation methods are not worried about these things so we need future efforts to get into these intersections also and also theoretical analysis whatever we have shown some of these examples they are not rigorous right there are not mostly intuition based although a weak mathematics is also there it's it's not reliably um, rigorous so we need explanations that are rigorous unless it is rigorous they are not faithful right all right so there is a lot of work to be done in explainable ai context and uh, i hope i have convinced you that there is um, some active ai research to be done uh, by all of us and i'm really sorry that i've taken a little more time than expected and this is this is the end of my talk yeah thank you Thank you, Dr. 